Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Want to finally start speaking in your target language? In this guide, you'll discover the top seven ways to practice speaking on your own with our lessons. Let's begin. Number one, shadowing. Shadowing is a proven learning technique where all you do is repeat what you hear in order to practice speaking. So access any audio or video lesson on the site and press the play button to start. Then as you listen or watch, just repeat the conversations or even easier, read along out loud with the dialogue section. The script is right there in front of you. With our lessons, you can master entire conversations just like that. Number two, read out loud. I just mentioned it, but reading out loud is another powerful tactic and deserves its own mention. With every lesson, you get written transcripts and translations. So as you play the lesson, read the dialogue out loud as you hear it. Why? By reading out loud, you're also practicing your speaking skills. You can do this with the lesson notes, the lesson transcript, or the dialogue tool. With the dialogue tool, you can listen to each line again and again, and repeat out loud until you master them all. Number three, speed up your reading to speed up your speaking. Being able to speak without thinking is a sign of language mastery. If you're talking to a native and can respond quickly, they'll assume that you're fairly fluent. How can you do this? When you read out loud, try increasing your speed a little bit every time. So start by reading with the dialogue tool. If you're like most learners, you'll read the first line slowly. That's because you're still getting used to the words, which is okay. Reread it. On your second try, you know most of the words and you'll read a little faster. Reread it again. On your third try, you'll be even faster at a native speaker's speed. And being able to read these phrases out loud and fast will help you speak fast. Number four, record and compare yourself with native speakers. In order to sound like a native speaker, you must imitate native speakers. So here's how. Access the voice recorder, which is in the dialogue study tool in every lesson. Click on the microphone icon, listen to the native speaker's audio, and then record yourself. You can then compare the two recordings side by side and practice and try again and again until you perfect your pronunciation. Number five, get feedback from our Premium Plus teacher. If you're learning by yourself and don't have access to real teachers, then you can always get feedback from our Premium Plus teachers. With the My Teacher tool, you can record yourself speaking and send the audio file to the teacher. They'll review it and tell you what to improve and how. That's it. Number six, level up your speaking with Premium Plus assignments. With Premium Plus, you can also get assignments that cover reading, writing, listening, and even speaking from your teacher. These assignments can be tailored to your goals and needs. You get a new one every week or anytime you're ready for a new one. Number seven, get even more lessons in the lesson library. If you want even more lessons on speaking and conversations, visit our lesson library and under category, choose conversation. You'll get all of the pathways and lessons that are focused on speaking. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share it with anyone who's trying to learn a language and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. I'll see you next time. Bye. Welcome to our first ever evening edition of this series because the sound in the original video was destroyed. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question this week. First question this week comes from Patrick. Hi Patrick. Patrick says, I know the basic English words and I understand if someone speaks in English. Uh, for example, I understand your videos perfectly, but I have problems building correct English sentences, like when I speak with another person. Do you have any tips for how to build correct sentences? Um, I think that this just comes with practice, honestly, it's difficult to do. But I know that there's not always a person that you can ask for help. I will tell you a secret. When I don't have confidence with something, when I don't know how to answer something, this is what I do.
seriously, just Google it. I put quotation marks around like the phrase that I'm trying to make and then I search Google for it. And if it's there, great, then that means I can use it. Maybe like thousands of people have used that phrase. I know it's probably a common phrase. If there are no results, then that probably means I've made a mistake somehow. So that's maybe one good way to help you as you try to build phrases by yourself. So try that out. Next question. Next question comes from Huang Sena. Huang Sena, hi. I love your name, Alicia. Is Alicia a common name in the US? I happen to have a friend named Alyssa. Also, what's your personal favorite name? Um, a common name in the U.S. Alicia. I don't. I don't think Alicia is so common in the U.S. And when I was growing up, I didn't have any other friends named Alicia. Uh, also, the spelling of my name is a little strange. Usually, it's spelled A L I C I A. Maybe you know the artist um, Alicia Keys. That's how she spells her name. So my name was commonly confused as Alicia a lot. So I've heard like Allison and Alyssa and Allie and so on. Those are fairly common, I think. But Alicia, especially my spelling, is not so common actually. So, hmm. uh, what's my favorite name? Uh, my favorite name is Obi Wan Kenobi. Next question. Uh, next question comes from Long. Is the H sound not always pronounced when followed by another consonant? For example, wall hanger or come back home. Yes, the H sound is often pronounced very uh, softly. It's quite difficult to pronounce all of these syllables clearly. Like in the example, come back home, it's quite difficult to say the H sound clearly. So in those cases, it's quite common to make the H sound quite soft, like come back home. Next question. Romeo from Vietnam. Hi again, Romeo. Romeo says, hello, Alicia. Do native speakers say you aren't gonna blah, 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 or you're not gonna blah, blah, blah? Which contracted form is used more? I think they're used equally. Like you can choose which you prefer. Me? Mm, I think I usually say you're not gonna. I probably use you are. I contract the you are. You're not gonna. You're not gonna, or you're not gonna do something. I probably use you're not more often than you aren't gonna. Next question is from Wagner. Wagner? 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 Have you written any operas? Why do American people pronounce English class 101 instead of 101 or 101? Oh, this relates to uh, like university and college level courses actually. So um, there are four levels to uh, universities or to colleges in the US. Uh, first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. So the classes for each of those are numbered. So first year classes begin with one, second year classes with two, third year classes with three, fourth year classes with four. So first year classes, like it tends to be like the basic classes, uh, begin with a one, and like the most basic uh, of those classes is usually 101. So like English class 101, that's kind of um, making like a friendly introduction to English, in other words. So we say 101. We always use that sort of um, pattern when speaking. We don't say 101. Uh, we always use 101 or like 124 or like 367. I don't know what those classes are, but we always uh, say each individual number. Nice question though, interesting. Next question is from Danny. Would you tell us about here you are, here you go, there you are, there you go, and here, there, we, you, it, they, we go. Oh gosh, okay. I'll talk about the, the ones that you introduce. What do they mean and how do you use them naturally? So let's talk first about here you are and here you go. So we use these when we present someone with something. So you give someone something. Here you are, here you go. Like you are at a restaurant maybe, your order arrives. Here you are, uh, here you go. Something like in a service situation, you might hear this kind of from like a friendly staffish, like staff related person, I suppose. Here you are, here you go. Or maybe from a teacher to a school child, maybe here you go. We use it to like present something, to present an object that maybe they are expecting to receive. Let's talk then about there you go and there you are. So we use there you go when someone is able to do a thing uh, they've been practicing for a while. So for example, if a child is learning how to ride a bicycle and they've been struggling with it for some time, but then gradually they get better at it and they can do it. A parent might say, oh, there you go, you got it, you got it. It's like a, it's like a support word, an encouragement word. There you go. Um, the last one on your list, though, uh, there you are. In American English, we use there you are in a situation where we're looking for someone. We've been looking for someone we're expecting to meet, and it's been difficult to find them. Maybe you visit a few different spots. 
but then at last you find this person maybe like in a break room or someplace you might not expect them but when you do find them and you say oh there you are we say it with that sort of intonation oh there you are it sounds immediately to the listener like oh this person has been looking for me next question next question is from L-O-J, L-O-J, Lodge, Lodge, L-O-J, L-O... L-O-J says, my question is about phrasal verbs. What is the meaning of knocked out? Like here, example sentence one, uh, knocked me out of my possession, or two, knocked the wind out of me. I had a problem with the word possession. Knocked me out of my possession. I'm not quite sure. This could refer, though, to, in a very rare situation, um, we have this word possession, uh, which refers to, like, this thing called demonic possession, where there's this idea that a bad spirit gets into the body and controls a person's behavior. We call that possession. So we could say, like, a priest knocked me out of my possession. To go back to your original question, though, the word knock out as a phrasal verb, uh, to knock out means, like, it means forcefully or forcibly remove something. Because of some impact, an object is removed from its original location. So, for example, a jogger could be coming at me, and they run into me and they knock my phone out of my hands. So in that case, my phone is being removed because of the impact of the jogger. So to knock something out means like to remove from its original location from force. In your second example then, uh, knocked the wind out of me. This is an expression we use which means like to lose our breath because of an impact. So um, if you get like punched or kicked maybe, in maybe this area, uh, you might feel the air in your lungs come out of your body. So we call that the wind in this situation. So um, like he knocked the wind out of me it means he caused me to lose the air in my lungs. The impact was so strong in my body that the air came out of my out of my lungs. So I like he knocked the wind. So the wind, in this case the air, in my lungs in its original location was removed from me because of this impact. You might also hear this expression in boxing, to knock out uh, or to, to, um, to KO someone, means to um, cause them to lose consciousness in this case. So consciousness is the thing that's, uh, that's going away in this case. So to knock someone out in like a boxing match uh, means they, they lose consciousness, in other words, a KO, we sometimes say. The first example sentence is not actually so clear to me, so it could, it, it's also possible there's an error in the original text. I don't know. All right, so those are all the questions that I want to answer this week. Thank you very much for sending your questions to me. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. Now I'm totally paranoid about my sound working. Sound. Sound. It's still working. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia and today I am joined again in the studio by... Michael. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about things that were cool in the 90s. So things that were interesting or things that maybe we were interested in in the 90s. I'm guessing that we're going to have some very different opinions uh, based on our experiences of the 90s. So let's get right into it. Michael, your first item please. Um, okay. Boy bands. So I remember boy bands were very, very popular uh, when I was a kid in the 90s. I had three older brothers who would punch me and tell me, boy bands are for girls, don't like boy bands. Um, so that was my experience with them. And they became kind of uncool, I feel like, after the 90s. And then they never were uncool in like Korea and like a lot of Asian countries. They still had like a strong boy band mm -hmm. kind of uh, scene or whatever. Men but, bands now. Is that really what they're called? No, I don't know. I just mean, I think, I feel like boy, there are boy bands. That are now becoming boys to men. Maybe that's the... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, now they, it came, <laughs> now it came back. Like, uh, what is the, uh, what's the British one? Now it's kind of cool again. Oh, One Direction. One Direction, yeah. So I think it's come back. It's full circle. Um, Didn't they just break up? I'm going to go with something that I loved in the 90s. This is probably way too specific. Uh... Probably. But it's this show called Doug that was on Nickelodeon. And there weren't a whole lot of episodes of Doug. It was, I don't know, like 20 or 30, I feel like. Not even that many. Did you many. ever see this show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very nostalgic for me. I 
don't twenty thirty episodes. I, do, I feel I feel like I had I'd seen them all, so I I I, I know that I saw them all mm-hmm. because they it would come back it would come on one day after school and I'd be like oh, I've seen this episode. Mm-hmm. But the whole the whole idea with Doug is Doug was like this just this plain kid and he had an older sister. He went to school. He had a dog. He had a best friend, and he would just encounter these everyday life scenarios that would be kind of troubling or he wouldn't know how to deal with them. But like he was kind of a role model, I feel like. He was kind of being like a good kid. Mm. Um, or sometimes he would get into trouble, but then, you know, eventually he would solve the problem or he'd find a way out of it. So, mm. but I really loved that show. I really loved Nickelodeon in general um, during the 90s. And yeah, did you watch that channel? Yeah, of course. I loved Nickelodeon. Um, I think it was more like Fox, stuff like that. But I guess I'll segue into another one of mine. Mm-hmm. You're talking about Wholesome. So something that's my childhood, I was raised on TV, was sitcoms. Yeah. So I think this has kind of died down, again, like the boy bands, where it, it, people think it's cheesy. Now it's all reality TV shows, that kind of stuff. But that is that is my childhood right there, is you know Full House and these kinds of shows, step by step, mm-hmm. where there's a moral at the end of the story. And right. so everyone, there's always kind of like, the, the protagonist is always like, maybe he's unsure, but by the end, they know the right thing to do, and they play like the violin, kind of sad, not quite sad, but like, heartwarming music and yeah. then they're like well and then they give a speech and as a kid you know That's you don't right. really like think about it but that gets into your like i i whew, man deep because of full house if you lie i've learned this it's deep in my subconscious if you lie and then you keep lying it snowballs and it gets worse and worse and worse so it's best to just right away tell the truth that was a r- really common theme in most sitcoms i think that mm-hmm. like they're just trying to teach kids don't lie it's bad yeah but. you're right you're right mm-hmm. sitcoms are huge and by the way sitcoms um is um is a portmanteau portmanteau meaning two words put together of situation and comedy so situation and comedy equals sitcom in this case okay <laughs> nice nice um i'm going to go to my next one um, let's see. I think probably every little girl in the 90s, in America anyway, knew what this was. I don't know if you knew. Um, it's this brand called Lisa Frank. Um, Lisa Frank. Are you aware of Lisa Frank? Are you aware of Lisa Frank? No? Okay. She knows. <laughs> she knows who Lisa Frank is. <laughs> so Lisa Frank is, um, just bright. It was always like brightly colored school supplies. Uh, like pinks and purples and blues, and it would always have unicorns and dolphins and mystical creatures. It was just bright, and everybody, all the girls loved it. I loved it. I had Lisa Frank, just whatever I could get my hands on. It would be pencils or erasers or just pinks and rainbows and hearts and stuff like that. So I think every every girl who grew up in the 90s knows what Lisa Frank is. Ah, okay. So talking about style and whatnot... Grunge. Grunge is something that I, that hits close to home for me and I think a, that came out of the 90s is, um, I mean, everybody knows around the world, I think most people know Nirvana, yeah. uh, Kurt Cobain. Yeah. And this is something that I guess was brought to the world from Seattle and it was a music genre and it was kind of, it's like rock, but sometimes slower, almost emo, kind of like sad, usually undertones. But anyways, the style that came with it was the opposite of like the 80s and, and early 90s of really bright colors. You know, it was the opposite. You just wear holy jeans. You don't really shower that much. You don't shave and like plaid and just really like dreary colors. Mm-hmm. So that was really popular. I, at least I remember in like the yeah, early 90s, it was like huge. mid 90s. Yeah. Nir- I, and it's, as soon as I saw that card grunge, I was like, Oh, Nirvana. That was, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I hear about, when I hear grunge. Mm. I didn't get into the grunge scene though. I was I was busy with boy bands, but like <laughs> grunge for me was never really. I was aware. I was aware of Nirvana, but I did not. I was not of the Nirvana mm. pod. Okay, I'm gonna go to a style point then too because you've brought up a style point. I'll put up, bring up maybe um, a female style point. Scrunchies, uh, still popular perhaps among some people. What is a scrunchie? A scrunchie. Let's see. I don't have a. Um, so there's regular rubber bands that you can use to tie back long hair. He's making an O okay. shape with his hand. Yes, <laughs> this is very descriptive. Very descriptive, Michael. Thank so, you. No, you. For that. I'm the prop, and then you go like this. Digga, 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 digga. There's like the. I bet. I bet. I bet. There's an awesome video team somewhere in the somewhere that can put mm. like a scrunchie like right here. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, a scrunchie is just a, it's just a, a a piece of elastic with some kind of colorful cloth wrapped around it, and it. But when not in use, it would go, 
and it would scrunch, I think. I think this is why we call it a scrunchie. <laughs> but then when you pulled on it, you could expand it a bit and wrap your hair up in it. And then when you were finished doing that, it would kind of close around it. Um, I had a couple. Nintendo, um, anything, any game-related stuff. I remember Game Boys, anything handheld. Um, except when I was a kid, it, it wasn't like this fancy 3D, high, you know, highly, like, vibrant colors. Mm -hmm. It was like black and white and like you'd play it in the car and you had to squint and it hurts your head you know if you're playing too much you're getting like car sick and you're like you can barely see mario are you That's talking about game boy game boy uh, or any like there was handheld too there was like atari and stuff like that and like sega sega was pretty good that would light up i was thinking about nes when you said nintendo i imagined mm. my nes the one that like when it wasn't working correctly you could just pull the cassette out and, be like, <laughs> and put it back in so you put the cartridge in here right and sometimes if it was really stubborn and it didn't work you would blow into this part and you try, and it really doesn't make a difference. But you would take turns. Like, me and my brothers would be like, no, you want to be the one to get it to work. So you take turns, you're like, no, 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 let me, let me, let me. And just by luck, it would work. And you're like, see, see, yeah. No, this is super nostalgic. I love Nintendo. I have a game, too. Pogs. Do you have Pogs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no Pogs are either are simultaneously the most brilliant game and the stupidest game ever invented. They're just disks of cardboard about this size. Uh... <clears throat> And on one side, there's a picture. And on the other side, there's just nothing. And then you had a, a thing called a slammer, which was essentially just a heavy pog uh, <laughs> that you would use. And you had to flip. You had to use the slammer to flip the I get plain that. cardboard ones. What? I don't even know. It, it was that stupid and forgettable of a game. But it was like crazy when I was about, I don't know, like second or third grade or something. Everybody had pogs. Like, mm. we had pog gym days at my school. I remember this kids, vividly. Like, America, we're really obese. Us. Let's go into the gym and sit there and smash cardboard. <laughs> that, that'll <laughs> solve the problem. We played pogs. <laughs> and, like, I was, telling, I was telling her before we started this, like, one day, like, my mom wanted me to get a haircut, and I was just being stubborn, and I wasn't having it. I was in the mall. I was like, I don't want to get a haircut. She's like, I'll buy you pogs. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. <laughs> it was like this giant tube of pogs, and I was just so thrilled, and I agreed to get my hair cut. Well, that was a lot of things that, was, that were exciting and or popular and or we were into in the 90s. What were you into in the 90s? What was popular in your country? I really have no idea what was popular around the world uh, at that time. Maybe some of these things are similar. Please let us know in the comments. I'm very interested to find out. We read these, by the way. Um, any thoughts? Any other any closing thoughts about the 90s? You're not going to sing a song for us? No mm, boy band bop, songs? Mm, bop, mm, bop. That's oh, that's copyright. We can't do that. Just like blur that all out. No, that was that was very accurate. So I'm sure we can use that. <laughs> and perfect. by very accurate, I mean totally wrong. Clearly, we're very good at talking about the '90s. Okay, but uh, we hope that you are too. We hope that you learned something exciting about the '90s. Um, that's all for us today. Thanks very much for watching, and we will see you again soon. Bye. Welcome back to the internet. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. First question. First question comes from Faris Ghazali. Faris Ghazali. How do I stop translating the meaning of English words in my head? I can tell you about the things that have helped me and maybe they'll help you. I put myself in situations where I could not escape into my native language. In my case, I could not escape into English. I would go out like for food and drinks with friends who could not speak English. I had no choice but to use a different language with them. Two, something that I've noticed some of my students do that actually kind of bothers me. They bring a dictionary to their lesson and they'll stop conversations in lessons to check words in their dictionary and say a single word at a time instead of just trying to find a different way to explain that. One, it totally stops the flow of conversation. Two, you don't have really the option to do that in a conversation. Most of the time you're not going to be carrying around your dictionary with you, I hope, unless it's in your phone, I suppose. Third, I think that this is a chance to develop a better skill. Instead of trying to translate into English or to translate into a different language, you should think about finding a different way 
way to explain the word you want to use. Let's say, for example, that you want to use the word beautiful, but you can't remember the word. How would you explain that? So think about other ways to communicate an idea, even if you don't have the vocabulary word. So going to your dictionary shouldn't necessarily be the first course of action. It shouldn't necessarily be your first step. Think about a different way to communicate the idea you're trying to communicate. Think of examples to explain the word you're looking for, and then the other person can teach you. Like if you're working with somebody or you're talking with somebody who understands you're not a native speaker, chances are if you can explain the word you're looking for, they will tell you, they will be your teacher. I just explain like with body language sometimes too, if I don't know a word. So another thing that really helped me was not just studying vocabulary words, but actually approaching things as phrases. So not saying, okay, this word equals this word in my language, but rather here's a phrase that communicates a meaning that is interesting to me or that I hear my friends use a lot. I'm going to use that phrase. So don't just input, input, input. Start outputting too. So hope that's helpful for you. Next question. Next question is from Huang Zhang Ik. Hi, Huang Zhang Ik says, I'm curious, what do you do in your days off? You wanna know what I do in my days off? On my days, I'm pretty normal. On my days off, I cook, I go jogging, I sleep, I, I go listen to my favorite DJs, I see my friends, I eat and drink and watch TV. That's about it. I'm a pretty normal person. Next question. Next question is from Muhammad Sohail. What is the difference between famous and popular? Great question. Famous is something that is well known. Many people know about that thing or that person. Beyonce is famous. The Statue of Liberty is famous. The Eiffel Tower is famous. Popular, however, means many people know about it and it is liked, it has a positive image. So like Beyonce is popular or like a famous candy is popular, like chocolate cake is popular. It's a famous food and many people like it. So popular is famous plus like a positive image. Sometimes we can use those two words for the same thing. So Beyonce is famous, Beyonce is popular, but famous doesn't always mean they are popular. So someone can be famous for a bad thing. In that case though, it's typically better to use the word infamous, infamous. Infamous means famous for a bad reason. So famous for something negative. Next question. Next question comes from, oh, you wrote the pronunciation of your name. Very nice. Aitan? Aitan, I think, okay. Hey Alicia, I hope you're well. Uh, my level is intermediate. They feel that they're stuck at the intermediate level and want to reach the advanced level. They're watching lots of videos on YouTube, reading academic articles on the web, but still feel that progress has somehow stopped. Could you give me some advice? Okay, you say in your message that you feel your progress somehow has stopped. I have been here too, the intermediate plateau. Like you begin learning a language and it's like, yeah, I'm learning all these things. And then you kind of like, plateau, you get to a level where things don't continue and you feel like progress goes much more slowly. I would say in this case, um, first identify how you feel your progress has stopped. By that I mean like, do you feel like uh, your vocabulary is lacking? Or do you find that it's hard to listen to people and to understand what they're saying? Do you find it's hard to write? Um, is it hard to, to like to read things? So first identify what is that thing that you feel like you're not good at and then start to approach your further studies with that as the focus. I think that if you can think about your different skill sets, your different levels in reading, writing, speaking, and listening, you can identify which of those four things is weakest for you and start there. So when you feel your progress has stopped, think like, okay, what am I not good at doing? And then focus your time there. So maybe that's a helpful first step for you. Hope that helps. Next question. Next question comes from Kiara. Chiara, Kiara, Kiara. Kiara asks, uh, I'll help you studying and I'll help you to study. What is the correct one? Thanks. I'll help you something. I'll help you do this. So just the regular plain form of the verb I would suggest is probably the most natural choice. Thanks for the question though. Next question. Next question comes from Sheriff. Sheriff Ahmed? Sheriff Ahmed? Okay. Should I use the singular or plural verb after colloquial names. For example, my team have won the match or has won the match. Ah, okay, in this case, 
uh, my team has won the match. My team has won the match. So use the singular form of the verb, like same as like he has or she has. My team has is the correct answer here. Next question. Next question comes from Jeffrey. Hi, Jeffrey. Jeffrey asks, sometimes I watch movies and some characters say you wish with a very angry attitude or I wish in other situations. What do these two sentences mean and how do I use it? Aha, interesting question. Okay, when someone responds with you wish to a negative suggestion, it's like they're mutually together, they're recognizing that they don't like each other. So usually the first character will say something like make a negative suggestion, like you should, uh, you should leave town and get a different job, like leave us alone, something like that. And then the other character will say, yeah, you wish, like, yes, this, this character recognizes you want me to do that, yes, but I'm not going to do that, in other words. So it's sort of like a challenge. So this person says like this negative suggestion, the other person recognizes this suggestion, says, no, I'm not going to do that, but I know you want me to do that. So you wish in this way, means it's like a negative challenge. They're, they're kind of fighting, recognizing they dislike each other. So that's one. The other one, what was the other one? So I wish, we talked about I wish in the previous, the previous episode of Ask Alicia. So please check that out. But essentially, I wish refers to something that um, we cannot do now or something that is different from the present situation, but we want, uh, we want to happen or we want to be able to do. So please check the last episode of Ask Alicia for more about I wish, like the positive meaning. Next question. Next question is from Romeo Liu from Vietnam. Hello, Romeo. Could you please explain what the expression try as I may means? Ah, this is usually used in an expression that's sort of negative. Like even though I'm trying my best, it's difficult for me to do this thing. So try as I may, I just can't get a new job. Or try as I may, I just can't earn that much money. Or try as I may, I just can't seem to cook this dish, for example. So even though I'm giving my best effort, even though I'm really working hard, this other thing just isn't happening for me. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like a sad or like a disappointed or um, unhappy expression, actually. Thanks for the question, Romeo. Okay, so those are all the questions for this week's episode of Ask Alicia. I hope that they were useful for you. If you would like to submit a question, remember you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next week. Bye-bye. I talk too much. I'm late for work. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. I have purchased a microphone. What can you do with a new mic? Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series on our YouTube channel where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. So please remember you can submit your questions to me at EnglishClass101.com slash Ask Alicia. First question. A lot of you have asked about what to do to get a, a voice that sounds like mine. When I'm making these videos, I'm specifically trying to speak clearly, so I'm clearly separating my words. The way that I talk with my friends and the way that I talk uh, regularly is a bit different than the way that I talk on this channel. But if you want to try to get this kind of pronunciation, the best advice I have is just to repeat this kind of pronunciation. It depends on your goal. If you want to learn to speak like me or to speak like somebody else that you really admire, you should try to mimic them. That's what I do. And that's uh, actually a strategy that I use when I study other languages as well. So if I hear something interesting, that a, a, a vocabulary word that a friend uh, has used, like in Japanese, for example, or they have a really good intonation or just the way they deliver, the way they say something is really uh, interesting to me or I want to, I want to be able to use that too. I put that in my head, I think about that, and then I try to replicate that, I try to copy that, essentially. To make this explanation shorter, mimic, mimic. If you want to learn to speak like me, mimic me. If you want to learn to speak like somebody else, try to mimic someone else. But just keep in mind that the way that I talk in these videos is different from the way that I talk in real life. Next question, what does the word lit mean? What does the word lit mean? Lit is actually a slang word, it's common 
slang among young people, especially in the US right now. Uh, maybe many of you know that uh, the verb to light has the past tense uh, lit. Lit is used to talk about, for example, a party or um, some kind of social gathering usually that's really exciting or that's really, really fun or that's kind of crazy. So lit, using the past tense there, you can kind of imagine that like a fire, when you light a fire, it maybe it gets bigger and it gets kind of wild, a little bit crazy, like there's a spark and then it starts. So if you see the word lit, like this party was lit, it means it was really crazy, it was really good, it was really fun. Uh, you can use it if you want, but just keep in mind that really young people use that word. I don't use that word for reference, but again, I'm not cool. Next question, what is correct? I thought you were gone or I thought you are gone. I thought you are gone. We need to use I thought you were gone here. I thought you were gone. So I thought, past tense, and you were is also past tense. It's a past tense thought, past tense situation. Um, so please use past tense. Yeah. Ah, next question, also maybe about were and was. Why do we use if I were and not if I was? Uh, this is a great question. And actually a lot of native speakers make mistakes with this. It's a small point to be fair, but if you want to be correct, uh, you should always use if I were. Um, this is a grammar point. Uh, it refers to the subjunctive mood, the subjunctive mood. It, a, an explanation of subjunctive is a bit beyond the scope. It's a bit much for this video, um, but we will always use if I were. Uh, when the subject there is I in the conditional, if I were, we always use were. You will hear native speakers say if I was, if I was. If you want to be extremely strict and extremely nitpicky, um, were is actually the correct one, but uh, if you use was, if you make a mistake and you use was, you will still be understood. So, um, but yes, this is related to the subjunctive mood in English. Next question. Okay, next one isn't really a question but something I have noticed that many of you do you like to put the article a or an before your adjective before an adjective but you forget to use a noun do you know how like Mario introduces himself and he says it's a me when you forget to use some kind of noun after after your adjective or whatever that you sound a bit like Mario's it's a nice it's a nice it's a nice what? It's funny to me, like, it's a nice, or, it's a me. <laughs> you need to include the noun that you're referring to. It's a nice video, or it's a nice explanation. It's nice, or it's bad, or it's good, or this was a nice explanation. But don't forget to use your noun after you use the adjective. It's a nice something. <laughs> it's a good something. It's a bad something. So please, uh, no article without a noun. Make sure to use your noun. And it should be in the singular form. If you're using a or an, you need to use the singular form of the noun. Don't sound like Mario. Next question. What does it mean they can't take that away from me? Who are they? And what does take away mean? We use the word they to mean generally, just other people outside of us. This is used a lot to talk about like news or to talk about general opinion. They say that this pizza is the best pizza in the city right now. They say that your English will only improve if you study every day. They say that the most difficult thing you can do in your life is move to another country. They is just anyone. Second point, what does take away mean? Take away means to uh, some object that belongs in one location is removed from that location. Like take away food. In American English, we use take out actually, but take away food is a similar idea, especially like in British English, take away. So you take away your food from the restaurant. So you're taking something else. You're removing your food from the restaurant. So in the expression, they can't take that away from me. They, meaning other people outside you, can't take something away from you. Next one. What does the phrase don't be a creep? Don't be a creep mean? Uh, I think Michael talked about this on an old English topics video. So I talked in a live stream about the word creepy, adjective creepy. So something that causes like nervous suspense is something that's creepy. The word creep is used as a noun. Don't be a creep. A person who is creepy. A, a guy can be a creep. A girl can be a creep. So a creep is someone who causes creepy feelings. Like, oh, something bad might happen. I feel nervous. Like, that person's a little strange, a little weird. That person is a creep. He's a creep. She's a creep. So don't be a creep means you should not behave like a creep. 
Don't create nervous feelings in the other person. Don't be a creepy person. Don't be a creep. Everybody, that's good advice. Don't be a creep. <laughs> Don't be a creep. Try to be a nice and understanding um, and respectful person, always. Next question. Oh, that was my last one for this week. All right, so those are um, my favorite questions or the questions that I wanted to talk to you about this week. I hope that those are some useful points for you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know at englishclass101.com slash askalicia. Um, that's where you can submit your questions to me. Um, it makes it very easy for me to check and see um, all the questions in one place. So definitely check that out. I think you can sign in with your uh, regular EnglishClass101.com account and submit as many questions as you want. And then I'll choose what I like and what I want to talk about. Uh, and of course, if a lot of you ask the same question, I'll, I'll definitely try to answer that too. So please check that out, EnglishClass101.com slash AskAlicia. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Ask Alicia, and I'll see you again next week. Bye! What are the things I can do with my microphone, I wonder? I feel like I had some ideas for this when I was laying in bed last night, and now I've forgotten them all. Oh, now I can take my videos on the road and be like a golf reporter. Uh, yes, the ball, the ball is rolling. Why am I Russian? I'm a Russian golf reporter now. Ah, oh, maybe I'll be a beatboxer. How do you do that? Oh. Hi everyone, I'm Bridget, and welcome to today's lesson. Today's topic is 10 ways to say hello in English. Good morning. Good morning is the first thing you say to someone when you see them in the morning. Good morning, sir. Would you like a cup of coffee? Good morning. Could I please get some orange juice? Good morning. I'm still tired from the night before. Hello. Hello is the most common greeting you'll hear. That and hi. Hello is a polite, Nice way to greet someone when you see them. Hello. Everyone says it. You cannot go wrong saying hello. Hello can be used at any time of the day, no matter whether it's morning or at night or at 4 a.m. When you see someone, you can say hello and it will still be appropriate. Long time no see. Long time no see. It's not necessarily grammatically correct, but it's a saying that we have. Hey, long time no see. What it means is that you haven't seen that person in a long time. So it literally means long time no see. Long time no see is something you say to someone when you haven't seen them in a while. Hey, John, long time no see. How are the wife and kids? How have you been? Hey, how have you been? I haven't seen you in a long time. How have you been? Is asking someone how they're doing and how they've been for the past however long if you haven't seen them in a while. You might say, hey, long time no see. How have you been? How have you been? That's past tense. It implies that you haven't seen them in a while and you want to hear about how they are and how they've been for all of that time that you haven't seen them. Hey, long time no see. How have you been? How are you? How are you? Means how are you doing? How are you feeling? How is everything? It's a standard thing that you might say to anyone, even if you've seen them the day before. You might see them today and say, hey, how are you? How's it going? Hey, how's it going? How's it going is a more informal way to say, how are you? So, how are you and how's it going, they mean the same thing. It's asking how you are doing, how you are feeling. Is everything okay with you? What's up? What's up is another way of saying, Hey, how is it going? But this one is even more informal. So you might say this to friends. Hey, what's up? And they'll say, nothing. Just living my life, you know, day in and day out. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Would you like some lunch? Good afternoon is a polite way to greet someone in the afternoon. So if you run into your boss, you might say, good afternoon. It's very nice. It's polite. Not a lot of people say it to their friends, but it's, it's a polite way to greet someone. 
Good evening. Good evening is a nice way to greet someone in the evening time. You can only use this phrase in the evening because it's wishing someone a good evening. It's saying hello at a certain time of day. Good evening. Would you like some dinner? Good evening. Have you eaten yet? All of my examples involve food, it seems. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. This is something that's very common to say the first time that you meet someone. You might shake their hand and say, Hi, it's nice to meet you. My name is Bridget. My name is... It's telling that person that you are happy to be meeting them. It's a pleasure to meet them. Hi, it's nice to meet you. That brings us to the end of this lesson, 10 ways to say hello. If you guys liked the video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. And don't forget to go to EnglishClass101.com for more English. Hey everyone, I'm Paris from EnglishClass101.com. In this video, we're talking about how to ask and give directions. Let's start. To the left, to the left. The first phrase is, where is the? Where is the? For example, you can ask, where is the bank? This can be used to ask for a general location or detailed directions. Don't be surprised if you only receive basic information. For example, next to the grocery store. The next phrase is, I need to go to the. I need to go to the. For example, you can say, I need to go to the police station. The word need is used, but this is used for non-emergencies as well. How do I get to the? How do I get to the? For example, you can say, how do I get to the museum? This question can be used to ask for step-by-step -step directions instead of a general location. Is the near here? Is the near here? For example, you can say, is the library near here? If you're unfamiliar with an area, you can ask to get this information about a specific place where you want to go. Is the bathroom near here? Excuse me, do you know where the is? Excuse me, do you know where the is? For example, you can say, excuse me, do you know where the park is? Only use excuse me when you're starting a conversation with a stranger. Another common phrase is, is the far from here? Is the far from here? For example, you can say, is the post office far from here? This is an indirect way to ask for directions. People will tell you how far the place is and probably tell you the best way to get there. Walking, taking a bus, driving, Uber. Now let's take a look at expressions to give directions. Turn left, turn left. For example, you can say, turn left after two blocks. This gives you information about how far you should go before you make any changes. In this case, you should go left. To the left, to the left. Turn right. Turn right. For example, you can say, turn right at the third traffic light. This also gives you information about how far you should go before taking another action. In this case, you should go right. Go straight. Go straight. This simply tells you to go in one direction. It also implies that if you keep going straight, that you will eventually find what you're looking for. Go past, go past. For example, you can say, go past the church. A landmark is just an easily noticeable place. For example, a movie, theater, restaurant. At the corner of, at the corner of. For example, you can say, it's at the corner of, this means that a place is located at the corner where two streets meet. In front of, in front of. For example, you can say the bus station is in front of the supermarket. We use front to refer to the main entrance of a building. It can also mean visible from the front and doesn't necessarily mean it's directly in front of something. Behind, behind. For example, you can say the parking lot is behind the movie theater. We use behind to say that something is at the rear of a building. The front of a building is its main entrance, so which side it's facing the street is really not important. Next to, next to. For example, you can say the restaurant is next to the park. 
This is an example of using a non-specific location to give general directions. Next to can be anywhere beside, in front of, or around a place. McDonald's is next to my house. Between. Between. For example, you can say, the store is between the coffee shop and the pet store. Between is used with two other places. When using between, the main place will always be in the middle of the two other places. Okay, that's all for this lesson. Which phrase do you like the most? Leave us a comment and let us know. And I'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Hey guys, I'm Paris from EnglishClass101.com. In this video, we'll be talking about making complaints in English. So let's get started. The first complaint is, I'm starving. I'm starving. This is an exaggeration you can use when you're hungry. I am always starving, even right now. The next complaint is, it's noisy. It's noisy. This kind of complaint is one that you would make to a friend. Telling the staff of a restaurant won't help since they can't tell people to be quiet. I hate when it's noisy in restaurants. Save that for another time. Then we have, it's hot. It's hot. This can be used to talk about the weather or the temperature of a room. You can add a request like, can you turn on the air conditioner? I am never hot, so I like that. The next complaint is, it's cold. It's cold. This can be used to talk about the weather or the temperature of a room. You can add a request like, can you turn on the heater? I always make this request because it's always too cold everywhere, everywhere. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. Even if you have enough money to buy something, it may be more money than you want to spend. It would probably be considered rude to say this to someone who works at a store, but I always think, okay, I'm in Gucci, it's way too expensive. <sighs> Another common complaint is, I'm tired. I'm tired. Use this complaint to imply that you want to sit down, relax, go home, take a break. When I babysit my five-year-old cousin, I leave thinking, I'm tired. <sighs> the next complaint is, I gained weight. I gained weight. This is a self-criticism that implies that you want to lose weight. Many people say, I got so fat. <sighs> I'm always broke. I'm always broke. Use this to complain about never having enough money. I am always broke because I always want more money. <sighs> the next complaint is, my job is boring. My job is boring. This is a really common complaint used by people who don't think their jobs are very exciting. Usually it means that you want to find a different, more fun job. It's all right, teachers, your job isn't boring. That person stinks. That person stinks. You can use stinks to talk about a literal physical smell or a general insult meaning that you don't like how someone smells. I hate when people smell on the bus. Not good, not okay. The next complaint is there's too much traffic. There's too much traffic. This is a common complaint among people who commute to work by car. Certain roads are especially bad during rush hour, which is the time in the morning or night most people are going home or to work. If I left at, it was 7 p.m., I would be here in 10 minutes. But because it's daytime in LA, it took me 30 minutes to get here, and I drive really, really fast. <laughs> and it still took me 30 minutes. The next complaint is, the Wi-Fi here is too slow. The Wi-Fi here is too slow. This is just a general complaint you may have about the internet speed. If you're at a cafe or somewhere with Wi-Fi, you can request that they reset the Wi-Fi to improve the speed. If you're having a party and you're having friends over and your Wi-Fi is too slow, you might as well end that party now. No Wi-Fi, no party. My boss is annoying. My boss is annoying. Annoying can be used to mean that someone does things that you don't like or they ask you to do things that you don't like. Either way, an annoying boss is a bad experience. I am very familiar with this. Hey Paris, grab me coffee. Hey Paris, check my emails. My boss is annoying. But don't tell him I said that. The pay is too low. The pay is too low. You can use this to complain about how much you make or to reject a job offer because it doesn't pay enough. I'm a surgeon. The pay is too low. I don't like it. 
I don't like it. This is a very general complaint that can be used for almost anything. What don't I like? <laughs> Posting a thousand selfies on Instagram. I don't like it. Mm -mm. Okay, that's it for this lesson. Which complaint do you like more? Leave us a comment and let me know. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Mm oh no all right welcome back to weekly words my name is alicia and this week we are going to talk about commonly used onomatopoeia this is going to be a fun one we talked briefly about an onomatopoeia zoom in a previous episode of weekly words we're going to talk some more about some more talk some more about some more we're going to talk about more today the first word is beep oh beep beep is any kind of electronic sound or a car sound it was also in a popular American cartoon, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. The Roadrunner would commonly say, meep, meep. Car sound will usually make a beep or a honk sound. For electronics, however, the beep becomes a little bit more robotic. We'll often say like, beep, 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 beep. <laughs> so in a sentence, let's say you have a computer problem. You tell your friend, the computer won't stop beeping at me. What do I do? Next is the sound jingle. Jingle is uh, any kind of light ringing sound. This word gets used a lot uh, in holiday seasons, particularly Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's. Any jingling sound is um, very commonly assigned to bells. Like the song Jingle Bells, for example, is a perfect example of this. Jingle is just the sound that a bell makes. In a sentence, let's see, you might say, she has a small bell attached to her phone, so she jingles everywhere she walks. It's really irritating. <laughs> okay. The next word is thump. A thump is for something to hit heavily. To give an example, the people who live in the apartment above me often thump on the floor. It sounds like maybe they're dropping something heavy or um, they're stepping very heavily. All right. Next is splash. Anything that falls into liquid, lands in liquid, makes a splash. It's that psh sort of sound that comes from water or any other liquid, really. We refer to that as a splash sound. There is also a popular Tom Hanks mermaid movie called Splash. This has nothing to do with that, about him falling in love with a mermaid. I made a big splash when I jumped into the swimming pool this summer. That has kind of a double meaning. Oh, mysterious. Next is blurt. It means to say something quickly. I blurted out the news as soon as I heard it. Like, I blurted out the secret. I couldn't hold it any longer. It means you just say something without thinking, to blurt. The first part of the word, blurt, that blurt sound, it sounds like something that just kind of is, sort of slips out on accident. And then the harsh t, blurt, the T at the end is like a kind of a final, like, oh my gosh, I've just said something. I've, I've slipped and then I've said something. Oh no, I didn't think about that. All right, that's the end of that one. So I hope you learned a few new onomatopoeias that you can try out next time. Thanks for joining us for Weekly Words and I will see you again next time, bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia and I'm joined again in the studio by... Michael, hello. And today we're going to be talking about English conversation strategies. So let's get right into it. Let's start with Michael. What is your first strategy for keeping an English conversation going? This is very important. Don't say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. You hear this all the time from second language English learners or non-native speakers. You learn this, it's one of the first things you learn in an English class. It's mm -hmm. easy, it's good, it's basic, it's foundation. Okay, that's fine. But as soon as you can, switch it up. Because to me, when I meet a foreigner and they come up, and if they say, hey, how are you? Say, oh, I'm fine, you know, I'm good, whatever. How about you? And they say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. And it's just... It's almost robotic because I've said it so many times. And when I hear that, I think, ah, their English isn't that good. Mm. And inside, I'm just going to be really polite and say hello and talk slowly and try to get out of there as quick as I can. So really impress the foreigner, in my opinion. I think the best way to do it is say something, you know, use a big word or just like a slang word, something like that. When I hear that, I go, wow, man, I want to know what this person thinks. I want to get their point of view and I'm really excited. And then I've had great conversations because of that. Um, yeah. Mm. That's a really, really good one. And actually, I think on this YouTube channel, actually, from a couple years ago, there's a video all about better answers to the question, how are you, than I'm fine, thank you, and you. Or if someone says, hey, how are you? I'm good. You? Or fine. You? Never, I'm fine, thank you, and you. Never. But try to actually use, you know, 
a phrase that a native speaker would use. And then that's a clue to the native speaker that, oh, maybe this person is ready for a conversation beyond, you know, basic English. So that's a really good point. I like that. I didn't think of things not to do. I only thought of things to do. So, okay, cool. Um, let's see. Let's go to my first one. Um, oh, oh, oh. So um, the strategy in general is just ask the other person a question. Uh, I think, and I'm guilty of this too when I'm learning another language, I tend to only get input. Like somebody else is always asking me the questions and then I forget myself to ask the other person a question. So one question that I like to ask or, you know, a variation, any kind of WH question is good, like a who question, what, where, um, something like this. If you've been paying attention, you can use anyway to transition in your conversation. This was in a previous video. You can ask something like anyway up to anything fun this weekend. This is a pretty casual conversational question that you can ask just about anybody, um, whether you've just met them or whether you've known them for a while, but just, just, Get in the habit of asking other people the question. Don't wait for someone else to ask you the question. Um, so that, that's one strategy that I try to use to keep things going. Yeah, me too. I agree. And I'm going to say same Z's because actually two of my questions were exactly what you said. Agree 100%. This is kind of cheating. These should be one. but So always ask questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, you forget. It's really easy. I'm really guilty of this. Mm. English, non-English, whatever. I'm, I'm guilty of this. Um, and the other thing is ask deep, open-ended questions. So if you ask a yes or no question, so again, like Alicia was saying, it, it just dead ends. Mm. You can't just say, you know, do you like cheese? Yes or no, right? So you want to say, what do you think about cheese? What is your favorite kind? And kind of open it up to something else and let it let it just kind of snowball. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's really a key. Like I have another variation on it, which I guess I'll just continue on to because it kind of relates to what you're talking about. Like he's saying, always ask questions, always ask deep, open-ended questions. So like you made, you just said, don't ask a yes or no question because yes or no ends with the yes or the no. So one of the things that I'll do is um, use a pattern similar to this, like hey, did you see or hey, did you hear about blah blah blah. So you can use this little blah 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 as your. Uh, you can ask about the news. Uh, you can ask about something funny you saw on the internet. You can ask about, um, you know, some something that you heard from another friend of yours. Whatever. Uh, it's just a way to check in with the other person and say, "Oh, did you also experience this thing that I experienced? Let's talk about that." So that might be another question that you can use with people. I like that one. I really like that one because you got to stay within people's comfort zone. So maybe you ask and maybe they don't want to, right? So a good thing is, did you hear about it? That's up to them. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. They can say, oh, yeah, I heard about that. And you can kind of feel uh, the, the atmosphere and, and realize, eh, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, change the subject. Or they get passionate and they start talking about it. And there you go. And just let it go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm. One thing, again, I'm guilty of is, is you do got to keep, keep returning it. Right. Don't, let it, don't just say, oh, yeah, and what I think about da 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 Bring it back. Ask them, what about you? Mm. That's, that's a common thing I forget about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, good. I have one more. This one, um, use when you see fit. Don't, I guess, just, okay, I'll just introduce it. Compliment the other person or compliment the other person. This can be a nice strategy just to show that you're enjoying the other person's company. Um, it can be as simple as, oh, I like your shirt today, or oh, that's a nice dress you're wearing today, or oh, did you get a new haircut that looks good on you? Something like that. So this is a nice, a nice way to make the other person maybe want to spend more time with you, I think. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, two things. One, I think it's a good conversation starter sometimes. Um, if you got to be careful. With a stranger, it can be creepy. It can be a little uncomfortable what you're complimenting, right? But if mm -hmm. it's something like if they have a t-shirt and it's a band that you both like, that's a great conversation starter, and you feel, wow, we're connected, you know? Mm -hmm. um, number two, the, the second thing I was thinking about is that keep it honest. I love, I love mm -hmm. a sincere compliment. It really means a lot more, and, and it really does butter them up, kind of get them open to, to having more conversations deeper, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things people do, which, which I don't like, is let's say they say, hey, nice shirt, and then the person out of habit will say, oh, you too, I like your shirt too. Just my opinion, I don't think this feels really natural, doesn't really feel sincere. So I would, I would save it, make a mental note and go, hmm, I need to return the favor. I need to give them a compliment. But wait until you notice something you really do like and say, hey, actually, I love blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a great point. Like hmm. when you, you can sense whether someone is being sincere or not. What is your next strategy <laughs> for continuing an English conversation? Well, don't be afraid to open up. 
I like this one. I think this is good. Um, a lot of people will be kind of shy. They won't open up too much. Again, within, within your comfort zone. But I like this one um, because people will return the favor. Because if you're just having small talk and you say, you know, the weather's nice today, blah, 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 you can only go so far. So don't be afraid to say something personal. Again, trust your judgment. Don't be a creeper. Don't go, we don't want to hear certain things about your life. So don't, don't be a creep. <laughs> don't be a creep. Don't be weird. Don't be strange. And like what you're saying about opening up. Open up is just a phrase that means share something about yourself. Um, so it can be as simple as what you did last weekend or what you're going to do this weekend or a project that you have coming up. It doesn't mean that you have to spill all of your life secrets to the other person, but just showing that you're willing to share something more personal about yourself can help ingratiate yourself or can help, you know, make the other person, help the other person understand you a little bit better. That's a good tip. I like that tip. That's hard to do though. It's hard. It's a mm. little bit scary, I think, yeah. to share parts of yourself, but it's good. It's a good way to meet people and make friends. All right. I think that's all. Is that all that you have? Yeah, that's okay. all I got. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, those are some interesting uh, strategies to keep an English conversation going. So give them a try. If you're ever at a loss for words and don't know what to say, you can try one of these strategies and hopefully it will help you out. Um, please let us know if you have any other strategies or anything else that you would like to use or you try to use when you are having trouble keeping a conversation going. Uh, leave us a comment and let us know what it is. We will see you again next time. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? That's about it. All right, so thanks very much for joining us and take care. Bye-bye. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.